Hi, this is uh, Ricky Spencer, convener for Sociology of Media for the Australian Sociological Association. And welcome to the very first Sociology of Media Voices uh, Media Bite series. And today we have a very special guest and it's the lovely Celeste Little. Um, many of you may be familiar with some of her work that she's produced in the media. And also she is recently being a candidate for the Australian Greens Party in Melbourne. So let's welcome Celeste and acknowledge Celeste. Welcome, Celeste. Thanks for having me on, Ricky. Um, look, I, I'll quickly do an acknowledgement. So before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm on Wurundjeri land of the Kulin Nation and pay my respects to the elders past and present. I'd like to also identify myself as an Arunda woman from Central Australia and um, acknowledge that the Wurundjeri have never ceded these lands, um, that these lands are stolen and that a treaty or sovereign agreement is yet to be negotiated for use of these lands. So as a visitor on these lands, I pledge my solidarity to the local traditional owners. Um, yeah, thank you for having me on, Ricky. <laughs> You're our um, first one. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I might talk a little bit about how I got into the media and mm -hmm. how it was a, a little bit accidental. Mm -hmm. um, but but why I think it was important. Um, so so I went back in, I think it was 2010, um, whilst I was working full time and I was doing a graduate diploma in, um, in arts, mainly in social sciences and political sciences and was learning an awful lot of stuff in that time. Um, you know, whether it was in, um, Australian political history or it was feminist um, studies or it was, um, I did a fair bit of gender studies. I did Middle Eastern politics, you know, I did, I did everything because I was just interested in the various topics and getting a broader world view. Um, but the problem with studying in me is that all of a sudden I had all of these ideas floating around in my head and nowhere to channel them and, um, and nowhere to play around with them and talk about them and, you know, and how they fitted in with my life experience. And at that time um, in the media, what I've noticed was that there were some Indigenous voices in the media, but mostly they were Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander conservative or moderate voices. And mm. I'm definitely not that I'm, I'm, you know, very much of the hard left tradition <laughs> and um, a unionist and feminist, and, you know, definitely a sovereignty activist. Like the amount of times I've been involved in rallies, I just lose count. But um but yeah, so, so those ideas weren't being reflected in the mainstream media. So what I did was I, um, I started up what I call an anti-media space. So my blog, Rantings of an Aboriginal mm -hmm. Feminist, was started in 2012. And it was started to be, you know, purely to be a place where those sorts of ideas could get played around with, where I could write about feminism and indigenous rights and um left-wing politics and and do so in a completely uncensored way um what i didn't anticipate was that the media had actually read what i was writing in this anti-media space and then start approaching me for mm -hmm. to be in the media so um i think it was six weeks after i started my blog um <clears throat> I was contacted by the editor of Daily Life, which at that point was a section in um, the Fairfax publication. So um, The Age and um, Sydney Morning Herald and every, you know all the other online ones that they've got. And she wanted to republish an art, um, a piece that I'd written on my blog about um, Aboriginal beauty pageants, which, you know, mm -hmm. was, was overall I wasn't a fan of the idea and you know was taking apart was taking apart the need to celebrate beauty as being inherently sexist particularly when 
the gaze is so white. So we're also mm -hmm. being judged on white standards of um, what Aboriginality is and what, mm. what womanhood is. Um, yeah. So, so um, she picked that one up and that became the first of my published by the media things. Um, I thought that was a one-off. Um, a couple of months later, I was contacted again by them um, to republish another article that I'd written. Um, and then that happened again, but with The Guardian. And so all of a sudden, a pretty radical Indigenous voice like mine was starting to be re represented in the mainstream media. And that was pretty bizarre. Um, and and I, I saw it as being important. Um, like, you know, I, at first I was scared that I was somehow selling out my hardcore um, anti-media stance by doing it. But then I actually saw it as important um, because what I saw happening was that, you know, because my voice was being taken up, other Aboriginal voices who felt similarly to me or, you know, held similar views or, um, or were speaking on things like sovereignty and treaties and all of that, they started getting space in the media too. So, you know, seeing people like, you know, Naya um, Gori, for example, start to appear in the media. Um, or, or the rise of Indigenous X as a, um, mm -hmm. as a space, you know, and seeing that continue to expand. Um, yeah, it, it, became, um, it became important for me to hold that space because the one thing that the majority of people in Australia haven't been exposed to is Indigenous debate. They seem to think that we all think the same. And, mm. and that's because the media has actively sought out, um, until quite recently, actively sought out voices that will give um, credence to the white masculine capitalist status quo. And so they weren't really interested in, in publishing those of us who don't. And and through the publishing of someone like me, all of a sudden a space was carved out that forced other me and sorry, and, and was carved out and was widely read and it forced other media organizations to start looking at our debates and engaging in them. Um, and that's really important. <laughs> I think, you know, the, the whole idea that the most politicized group of people in this country were born into politics, you know, um, don't debate was just, ex you know, until then extraordinary. <laughs> and that's really interesting. So could you say that the advent of digital platforms has really given you that space to then have that voice on other realms to go out to the wider community? Yeah, absolutely. And I reckon that many other um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who've carved out um, online spaces would agree with that. Um, mm. You know, all you need to do, for example, there's definitely, like I said, there's definitely Indigenous X and the space that they've carved out for, for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voices. But all you need to do is um, jump on Twitter, for example, and and look up the hashtag blackfella twitter and you see you know this continual commentary being done by aboriginal and torres strait islander people online um and that's being engaged with more and more i mean the media itself i 10 years ago we didn't see embedded um tweets within news reports you know as a comment um journalists had to go out and get a comment from somebody but nowadays they'll take comments off the social media um, platforms in order to place them in a story and say this discussion was going on. Um, and to, you know, to see such an active space, but um, active blackfella space on Twitter is amazing. But the other thing I'll say too, is that um, I don't think like, I remember reading a study ages ago, maybe about five, six years ago, um, which, and I think it was Bronwyn Carlson was the one who um, wrote about it. Um, but 
it was noted that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people use social media platforms at a rate 20% higher than everyone else in the country. And that doesn't matter where we live in the country, um, whether it's the big cities or it's the most remote areas. And I think that we do that in order, well, we, we initially started doing that as a way of networking you know, community across country. And we were really quick to see the potential of, of social media and the fact that we could have voices without them being owned and unfettered and we could have discussions with other mob. Um, so yeah, social media has really changed that landscape a lot. I mean, someone like me wouldn't have gotten, gotten a um, column years ago yet. I've had one for four years with one publication and it's, it's the third column that I've had with a media publication. That's <laughs> wonderful. Maybe can I ask you now, where do you see the future of, um, I guess, voices for Indigenous um, people? Do you see the digital space becoming a more of a mainstream platform and therefore maybe we have to reinvent another kind of platform to have voices or do you think it will stay the same? I, I do wonder about that um, because I think that social media now, so something like Facebook is the equivalent of what making a phone call or sending a text message was um, 10, 15 years ago. You know, it's so normalised in the way that we communicate that, um, yeah, a lot of people can't envisage life without social media. So, so um, what's the next step, step for it? I'm not sure. I um, was doing a master's last year and a lot of it was argued that, you know, we'll probably the next steps or augmented reality, but I don't know how that would work for Indigenous spaces unless we are potentially sharing language or culture mm. across um, digital divides. But, um, but yeah, it's, you know, what the one thing that I do hope is that, um, is that, well, I really hope that we actually start building alternate platforms to the ones that we see and um, publicly owned or collectively owned um, social media platforms because, mm -hmm. because when things like Facebook started, they were, um, the, you know, they were started for profit. They're private companies and, you know, the, the, the amount that they draw in is extraordinary. And so our usage of them is tied into how much profit that company can drive. And so, so instead of um, voices being drowned out by the traditional media sources, what we've now got of um, different voices being drowned out by um, the commercial media source, the commercial online. And we do need alternatives to that. So um, if there was an Indigenous um, social media platform or an, even just an Australian publicly owned social media platform, I'd be there in a shot um, because I think it's so important that we as the people own our voices rather than our details being sold off to corporations in order to to profiteer off what we say, if you get what I mean. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that, that's, that's wonderful. And it really shows that how really when we start thinking about it at that deeper level um, and everything that's happened, I guess, in the recent years with the demise of um, the conglomerate uh, media sources with Murdoch mm. and hoping that, um, see what transpires there once he does um, leave that space what happens next and whether there'll be a change. But obviously I like that idea that of thinking of alternatives and, and community led um, ways of ownership might pr provide a new way of 21st century um, workspaces of learning and, and making money and sharing ideas. So that's wonderful. So Celeste, thank you so much for uh, coming on today on our first um, session and if anyone would like to say follow you on twitter or, or digital platforms would you like to um this is your time how can people reach you if they want to follow you and hear more of your ideas yeah so so on twitter i'm just simply at utopiana so that's you know 
U-T-O-P-I-A-N-A. -A. Um, on Facebook, I've got two pages. So one of them is Black Feminist Grantor Celeste Little, which ties into my my old writing and the writing that I'm still doing. So it's my old social media um, space that's still alive and kicking after this many years. Um, but my new page um, around my Greens candidacy for, for the Cedar Cooper um, is Celeste Little Greens. Um, so you can find that too. And there you'll get a little bit more of the, the kind of ideas that I'm trying to take um, from from this amazing electorate I live in to Parliament, should I be successful? So yeah, we'll see how we go. <laughs> well, thank you, Celeste, so much, Celeste Little, for coming on today and sharing some of your wisdom and ideas about voices in um, the sociology of media in Australia. Thank you. No worries. Thanks for having me. Thank you.